We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are here with something a little bit different for you guys today. We are, we are. We're here with a little bonus episode. We are here with our new series from the DMs. So as you all know, Catherine and I started this podcast originally just talking back and forth in our Instagram DMs, and we decided to start an actual real podcast. So we have decided to take that material and take our actual live DM that we still have because we refuse to communicate in any other way than our Instagram (laughs) DM. Exactly. We honestly don't text. We just talk through our Instagram DM. So we decided to take one of the things that we talk about a lot in our DM and which is also a really big topic flying around the F1 world right now and talk about it kind of just live between the two of us. We also want to hear your guys' take on it as well. So feel free to join in the conversation with us. So, Catherine, what is the first topic that we will be talking about on From the DMs? Uh, We are going to be diving into, um, is Max Verstappen and Red Bull's current dominance damaging the sport of Formula One in both the United States and also internationally? Great questions. I have a lot of thoughts and feels about this. (laughs) I do as well, which is why we're having an episode about it. Um, But I want to start off by just noting that we are relatively new Formula One fans. And A, we don't feel bad about that. But B, we just want you guys to know that we are coming to this from the lens of not just new American Formula One fans, but also new American Formula One fans who have a very different perspective of sports because, and if you've listened to to our introductory podcast, we have both worked in sports professionally um, in the college athletic space, and that has definitely changed up our perspective, and we have a different perspective than just somebody who likes a sports team or likes a, a, you know, a, a, a certain sport. Um, so those are are things that that we want to you know say right off the bat especially coming to you know this type of topic which has been very heavily debated um you know over over the these last couple of years exactly yeah so where should we start with this Catherine I don't know what what I what I also you know what what just actually come, came to mind is I also don't have a lot of people to talk about this to like obviously you and I have talked about this um, but I also like of the the people who watch Formula One in my life you know my sister watches it sometimes doesn't really have opinions my best friend watches it but he also doesn't have opinions and he just has a bunch of questions for me whenever he gets around to watching a, a race or a qualifying session um, my dad and I pretty much agree on on most things related to the sport and you know the person who got me into to formula one um we we don't really talk anymore so i don't really have a lot of people to talk about this with um but i I think that it's especially (laughs) besides you of course um but like I, you know, I would, I would love to hear, and especially if you're listening to this and you're American, um, or even if you're not American, I would love to hear your opinions on the sport. If, you know, whether you're new to watching Formula One or if you've been watching Formula One for, for a few years now and you've seen the kind of ebbs and flows of, of different teams of dominance, which is something we'll dive into a little bit more. I think I definitely have an interesting perspective from the world piece, just living in a different country. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm an American, but I'm living abroad. And so I talk about Formula One with a lot of people because a lot of people are fans here. Um, When I work out with my trainer, the entire hour of it is talking about Formula One while I'm like trying to count my reps and figure out what I'm doing. And it's like very, very hard. I'll be like holding a plank with 15 kilos on my back and he's like, so the race. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. (laughs) Um, But it's actually really fun to be able to have a crowd of people around me to talk about this with. But every time that I talk with people, they're always like, oh, Max is just going to win again. Red Bull's just going to win again. This is boring. We don't like this. But a lot of them are Ferrari fans. And Ferrari has a very large 
history in the sport. They've been around for a very, very long time. But if you look way, 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 way back, Ferrari also had a dominant stint in this as well. So I feel like this whole entire thing of the current dominance versus prior dominance is very much throwing stones in glass houses, Um, Mm -hmm. especially with Mercedes fans, if we want to, you know take a step back and look at who previously won eight constructors in a row. Um, But I think I have a different, I don't know. But at the same time, people here as well are like, oh, Max is so, so good. This is really cool. It's really exciting to see someone so, so dominant. Because if you look in a lot of sports, more so individual, because I know this is a team sport, but sometimes it seems like an individual sport if you it's see like an individual, exactly. If you see someone like really, really dominating in the hundred meter sprint, right? It's like, wow, they're so fast, so dominant. This is amazing. This is really cool, really exciting. And so I kind of see it as an individual sport almost. And I think some people here do as well. Of like, Max is so, so good. This is amazing. How can a driver be this good? Whereas. Mm-hmm. I think on the flip side, there are some people who are just so diehard, you know, Mercedes or so diehard Ferrari, where if it's, you're not, you know, if their driver isn't the one dominating, then they're going to be upset about it. Yeah, I think that that's really, you know, important to, to remember is that like, it's not just, you know, you're here to enjoy 20 drivers driving on track, like, you have maybe two favorite drivers, maybe a couple more that you like, but you t- you're you gonna, you know, naturally gravitate toward, you know, one team. Like, I'm kind of a dick. I gravitated toward the teams that are kind of dicks. Um, if, if we, if we want to be, be um, honest about it, you know, the, what teams and the reputations they have. Um, and I, I accept that about myself. I'm okay with kind of being a dick. Um, as long as you accept it. That's all that matters, Catherine. Exactly. <laughs> So like, so, cause like, like I, I said, you know, in, in my, you know, why we F one podcast, like I took one look at, you know, Max Verstappen and, you know, the, the way that the Red Bull team presents itself and like, that's my team. Um, well, and, 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 and like, that's... for me, it's like the history with Ferrari and I'm like, I love the history. And even though they kill me every single weekend, like that, I love the history. And if you look back, they do have a history of dominance. Yeah. I, they, they right. have a history of dominance, even though they haven't won a driver's championship since Kimi Raikkonen. Um, yeah. But, you know, you know, I, I did some, some, you know, research going into this, and we have only had seven different world champions since um, 2000 when Michael Schumacher won his third driver's championship. So, and that's 30, that's 23 years at this point. So it's not like, you know, we, you know, had a period of, you know, a different, you know, a different team winning every year. And then all of a sudden, you know, Red Bull had the dominance with Seb Vettel. And then Mercedes came in for eight years with, um, with Lewis and with, with Nico Rosberg. And then now we're, we're back to, to Red Bull. Like this is something that we've had for a while. And then if you go back even further, um, yes, there were more different drivers winning, um, for the, you know, 20 or so year period between eight, 1980 and 2000, but that was also still predominantly two different constructors that were winning. It was predominantly Williams and predominantly McLaren. Yeah. Exactly. It's very, very, I don't want to say like, we know it's going to happen, but it's almost kind of predictable in how this sport works. And I'm going to say a lot of it has to do with what I, at least what I think. Um, Again, I'm not an expert. This is all just my opinion, but I think it has a lot to do with the FIA regulations changing. So as they change every five years, they you know, you have to put so much engineering and so much work into the car for those five years and then it completely changes. So if you have something that works and no one else can figure it out, kind of like Red Bull, what what's happening with them, then you're going to have dominance. And then slowly, slowly, slowly cars will kind of start to, you know, pick up, but you'll still, you know, keep improving your car. And then the regulations change. And then maybe Red Bull is still like already is looking forward to those regulation changes or whatever, and they're working towards that, towards the end of the current regulations. Or maybe it's another car that just really jumps forward 
And now, and then they're the ones that are dominant, but it's very, very different. It's not like you can just keep building your car, keep building your car, keep building your car, because we're going to have changeover with the regulation changes. It's not like you're just, it's not like an, a normal, you know, again, from the U.S. side, a normal American sport, like NBA, NFL, whatever, you're building a roster, you're drafting people, you're letting go of people, you're in your front office, whatever, you're constantly changing things. Like this has to do with engineering and physics, not just people. (laughs) There are other factors involved that are not just humans. So when you have those things, I think, I don't know, that plays a big part of it. Yeah. And I, I think that there's, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for, you know, having the excitement of, you know, one team really being able to master those regulations. Like even, you know, there, there have been interviews where Christian Horner has talked about how when Mercedes started winning, that was a really tough time for Red Bull because they weren't getting the handle that they wanted on those regulation changes after they had all the success with, you know, Sebastian Vettel winning four titles in a row. Um, and, and that was really hard for the team. And that was, you know, kind of their, their purgatory era, so to speak. Um, and, and you, you even saw it in those early episodes of drive to survive from those first couple of seasons when Mercedes was still being Mercedes, that like, that was the team that everyone was looking at when they when the cars were starting to do their shakedowns it's like what did Mercedes do to their car and the only difference between you know, what 2017 and 2023 is now they're just looking at Red Bull exactly exactly it's it's the same thing it's just a different constructor yeah and like if you look at you know I I'm I'm looking at the the 2016 season for something that we'll see eventually um and um you know that season, you know, Mercedes won all but I think like two races, um, and that's you know, where where the where where were the crowds in pitch, of Pitchfork uh, bearing angry angry Formula One fans back then? I mean, I don't think that there were, and if they were, they weren't as as vocal. And you still, I mean, you're always gonna have pockets of people being, oh, Mercedes is doing Mercedes things again. Um, but it's, and we'll have you know, people doing like, oh, Red Bull's doing Red Bull things again. Yeah, and I think exactly. maybe the difference is, like, it wasn't just one driver. Like, Ma- I think it's because Max has won every single race besides two, and then it was Checo. And, like, the like you were saying, you know, Mercedes was on every podium, and they were doing really, really well, but they didn't have, like, this level of dominance. However, yeah. they were still dominant, and, like, in every sense of the word. And I don't think just because they didn't, you know break the wiki wikipedia page record whatever <laughs> total wolf like they were still doing very very good and everyone could still make the comments that they're making about red bull today about mercedes you know six seven years ago so yeah and and there, there have been a lot of people you know who are who are pushing back at at people who are who are who maybe are saying you know the fia should step in and stop red bull from being as dominant as they are but that's not the right answer. And if that is something that would happen, that would do irreparable damage to the sport. Uh, you can't have people being like, oh, you actually figured out the regulations too good, so now we're going to penalize you and do something. Yeah. Like, who's going to want to participate in this sport, one? What fans are going to be like, oh, yeah, let's have someone, like, constantly telling people, oh, you're doing too good, let's take something away from you. Like, that ruins the sport completely. And even, like, the driver... Sorry to cut you off there, Catherine. I'm just very passionate about this point of, like, let them play. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people joke that, like, the NFL is scripted. Well, if you want to turn Formula One into a scripted reality show, then that would mean that the FIA would have to do something to step in and, you know, tell Red Bull, you can't be good anymore, um, and and we're going to, to penalize you for your success, which is absolutely asinine to me like I you you can't you can't do a sport with that mindset or with that you know Formula One is is a historic championship sport that is the pinnacle of motor racing and if it wants to continue to be the pinnacle of motor racing it has to allow drivers and teams to be that pinnacle of motor racing and to, to push the limit and you know even if that means that sometimes you're going to have a record-breaking driver who's going to win 10 
plus more um, uh, races in, in a row, and it means more than just updating a Wikipedia page, Toto. Yeah, exactly. And even the drivers agree. Like, I'm going to read this direct quote because I think it's important that we get this direct quote from Carlos. Like, someone asked him about Red Bull's dominance and, like, if it's bad for the sport and just in general what he thought of Max and everything. And he said, I've never been a fan of being concerned with one team dominating because if they've done such a good job, then they deserve it. And then he also said, I wish it was us. And then I would get really angry if people were concerned that we are dominating in Formula One. So, like, yeah. exactly what Catherine was saying is, like, they did a good job. They deserve it. Stop bitching. <laughs> Move yeah. on. And I think it's it's also a really important that these... The, the, these comments are coming from the people who are the current generation of the sport, but also the future, you know, as we have, you know, drivers staying in their, in their seats longer and longer and more of those drivers, um, that are, that are signing longer and longer contracts. Like these are the guys who are going to be driving in the next regulation change in 2026 and who knows could still be driving in the next regulation change in the 2030s. Um, yeah. and you know, that's that's something you know this the the future of formula one is now but also it's you know the you know if if they have concerns they're clearly going to air them you know max has even said if red bull can't give me a, a competitive car in you know i'm 20, leaving 26 27 I, i'm i'm taking my i'm taking my toys and going home um but also he's gonna probably be a gazillion time world champion at that point and no one's gonna begrudge him for wanting to retire um but i think that you know over in the long term and thinking about the sport in the longer term which you know in the united states we don't really think about that because we've really only had formula one back in the prevalence of our lives um since drive to survive started airing um but i think that you know in in the long term this is just going to be another one of those, you know, Max is going to be a historic name like Lewis Hamilton, like Michael Schumacher. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be another young upstart driver who's going to replace him. Um, and for, for people who are struggling through this short term of turning on and seeing Max win every race, you know, also remember you've got 19 other drivers who are fighting for position two and those battles are also just as exciting as seeing someone win a race week in week out yeah i That's mean my soapbox. i was gonna say <laughs> I, I, I might call track limits on you there <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> it's okay um no i think it's definitely like to your point yes it's fun to watch the other 19 places but obviously we're watching for the winner but of course i think the the big thing is for me on this is does this help or hurt the sport and i think globally whether you're in the US or worldwide i think there's so many people who have who are invested i think this does nothing f like to hurt or like har like it it does nothing positively or negatively. I think in one, you could look at it like it could negatively impact it because people are bored. And on the other hand, it's like, oh, wow, this guy is going to break every single record. This constructor is going to break every single record. Like, I'm going to start watching. So I think you have, like, kind of a you net to no impact. I right, think yeah. from the U.S. side, it's – it could potentially hurt because you have to remember, like Catherine was saying, we have a whole new crop of fans coming from Drive to Survive. And Drive to Survive, you get to see some really good fighting, some really good racing, and it's super, super, super competitive. And now you maybe this is your very first season watching live because you've caught up on Drive to Survive. Now you're watching it. And Max is winning by 23 seconds. And Max is winning by, you know, 18 seconds. And he's beating his own teammate by 12 seconds. Like, what's going on? This is not an eventful. This is really boring. I'm over it. So you could potentially, like, have a fan and drop a fan. So I see it maybe being an issue in the U.S., but not globally. Yeah. I also think it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that, like, 
you know, obviously Formula One gets a lot of money out of the United States with the, the Grand Prix that they're going to be, that they're hosting. And, you know, we're coming up on Vegas in, in a couple of months. But I think it's also interesting that it's like, if the Americans don't like what's happening in Formula One, Formula One doesn't give a shit. Like, they're still going to do what they do. They're not going to, like, overcorrect on regulations to, you know, they, they've they already done so much with the regulation changes to, you know, bring the pack closer and to make these cars faster and more competitive. Um, but they're going to take the American complaining with a grain of salt, which, as an American, I think they should. Yeah. I don't think there's enough of us to, like, do anything either. So, if. Yeah. If the Europeans start complaining, they might do something. But the Americans, I don't think they're going to, you know, will complain about anything. So, Yeah, there's but, enough people in our Instagram comments who are like, oh, these American fans don't know what they're talking about. And you know what? We don't care because we're still going to keep doing this podcast anyway. I know. It's fine. We, I mean, but I'm, I'm the first one to admit I don't know everything about F1. And I guarantee you everyone commenting and saying things doesn't know everything about F1 because... It's yeah. constantly evolving and changing, which is what's so great about this sport. So, but long story great. short, I think, you know, the dominance is just the proof is in the pudding. This is how the sport works. This is what we're used to seeing. It happens. This is F1. I don't think it's bad. I think it is what it is. This is the sport. Yeah, this, this is, you know, for, Formula One will always have a dominant team that will be dominant for a few years. Um, and that is something that if you're new, that you'll get used to. And if you're old, you already, you already know what we're talking about. And you're, you're already, you're already living. If you're old, you're an old formula, older formula one fan. <laughs> yes. If you're, if you're, if you're pushing person. 60 and know what we're talking <laughs> about. Yes, exactly. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's a fact of life and you'll, you'll get used to it. And if, if you really, you know, want to continue enjoying the sport, you will find ways to continue to enjoy the sport. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I freaking hate it as a Ferrari <laughs> fan, but like well, yeah. I've accepted it because I know it's going to happen. Like, I just know this is, you know, that's why I keep saying in every single podcast, just let Max win every single race have Red Bull win every single race, wipe this year off the table, and we'll start again new. We'll start again new next year, like or maybe yeah. the next regulation change. Like that's I'm, but that's why I say it because I know this is how the sport goes. So it's mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. Yeah, and but. also Carlos made it like as we talked about in the the Italian Grand Prix recap, you know. Carlos made it really exciting, and I think that, you know, all the other teams are going to make, if, if Max is going to win every race, you know, from, from now to the end of the season, I think that if, if Max doesn't qualify well, they're going to make him work for it. And Max doesn't always qualify great. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not like they're not going to not make him work for it. Like, oh, it's Max. We'll just let him on by. Well, no, but, but, I, but I'm just saying, like... This, I know what like, you mean. <laughs> This this was this probably the second most competitive race that he's he's run this entire season. No, that's and the fair. other one was Anvort. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, anyways, we want to hear your thoughts and feels on Max and Red Bull's dominance this year. What you think about it? If you hate it like I do, if you've accepted <laughs> it like I have, if somehow you're enjoying it like Catherine is, uh, let us know. Love to have a conversation with you. Nicely, uh, Nicely in the comments. <laughs> Please be nice. Um, but that's the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.